Now, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and as we've reported, this cruelty has surged around the world along with the pandemic due to mandatory lockdowns with abuser and victim trapped inside together. Our next guest knows firsthand the devastating impact of violence in the home. Pulitzer Prize winning poet Natasha Threway was 19 when her stepfather murdered her mother. This excruciating pain is the subject of her new book, Memorial Drive, A Daughter's Memoir. She also writes about growing up in the 60s in the Deep South as a mixed race child. And here she is in a raw and often emotional conversation with our Michelle Martin. Thanks, Christian. Natasha Trathaway, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I think many people are familiar with your work. You've won multiple awards. You're a respected, highly sought after college professor, teacher, former poet laureate of the United States, a high honor. I feel comfortable in saying that I'm sure millions of people know your work. And I remember reading a brief biography of you. It said her father, Eric Trethewey, was a poet. Her mother died when she was in college. Mm -hmm. Her mother died when she was in college. So just to get to the, the core terrible details, your stepfather, your mother's ex-husband, who had physically abused her and frankly, if I may say, emotionally abused you, mm -hmm. uh, killed her when you were only 19 years old and when she was 40. She had finally gotten free of him. And frankly, it, he seems to have been threatening her for, for years, uh, for what I can see. Mm -hmm. Why this book now? Did, did this book sort of force its way out of you? Why this book and why now? I, you know, I think it did. You know, I, I've been carrying this grief with me now for 35 years. And more and more, my mother was being erased. Um, this erasure was ongoing. Um, it was particularly easy for people, as I said, to draw this line uh, straight through my father to me. Because my father was a poet, my father was also my white parent. So there was something both racial, racialized and patriarchal in this assumption that I'm who I am because of my father. And it wounded me deeply that um, people didn't understand that the thing that hurt me into poetry, that uh, the thing that I had tried to contend with my whole adult life was the loss of my mother. I felt like I needed to tell that story and to place who she was and what she meant to me in its proper perspective. Uh, the, the title of your book, of course, is Memorial Drive, and it comes at this remarkable moment of reckoning for the country, where this country is reckoning with its racial past, as it does periodically. And one of the remarkable things about your book is the way it intertwines your personal history with that of the history of the South and of the country. So I was, to that end, I just wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind reading a passage for us. From the oh, of course, I'd be happy to. Mm -hmm. This is from the first chapter, which is called Another Country. In the spring of 1966, when I was born, my mother was a couple of months shy of her 22nd birthday. My father was out of town traveling for work, so she made the short trip from my grandmother's house to Gulfport Memorial Hospital as planned without him. On her way to the segregated ward, she could not help but take in the tenor of the day. Witnessing the barrage of rebel flags lining the streets, private citizens, lawmakers, Klansmen, often one and the same, raising them in Gulfport and small towns all across Mississippi. She could not have missed the paradox of my birth on that particular day, a child of miscegenation, an interracial marriage still illegal in Mississippi and as many as 20 other states. Sequestered on the colored floor, my mother knew the country was changing, but slowly. She had come of age in the summer of 1965, turning 21 in the wake of Bloody Sunday, the Watts riots, and years of racially motivated murders in Mississippi. Unlike my father, who'd grown up a white boy in rural Nova Scotia, hunting and fishing, free to roam the open woods, my mother had come into being a black girl in the Deep South, hemmed in, bound to a world circumscribed by Jim Crow. Though my father believed in the idea of living dangerously, 
the necessity of taking risks. My mother had witnessed the necessity of dissembling, the art of making of one's face an inscrutable mask before whites who expected of blacks a servile deference. It's always tricky asking an artist how she makes her art, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I am wondering how you arrived at this voice, how you arrived at this kind of intertwining of the personal with a, the social story, mm -hmm. you know, the mixing of the races, the expectation of white supremacy, the expectation of deference. Was it hard? Well, you know, it, it took a long time to write this book. It, it took me seven years to write the book. And I think part of the hardest thing was to figure out the voice. Uh, who am I in telling this story? And what is the story that needs to be told? I mean, because they're obviously the, the tragic facts of my mother's life and mine, but that's not the story. And I, when I really, what I realized, and it has everything to do with that intersection of uh, public history, the history of uh, the Civil War and the aftermath and the monuments we've erected to remember or misremember the Civil War and my mother's death at the base of Stone Mountain, that largest monument to the Confederacy. Those things converge and they actually represent my two existential wounds. You know, in his memorial to William Butler Yeats, W.H. Arden wrote, Mad Ireland hurt you into poetry. Mm -hmm. Well, likewise, my nation, my native land, my South, my Mississippi with its history of violence and racial oppression inflicted my first wound. Um, being born there on Confederate Memorial Day was as if I were given that history to write. And then when my mother's death occurred at the base of that mountain, I could see how what is remembered and what is not was the very threshold um, through which to enter this book. This book is so beautifully written, and yet it is so, if you don't mind my saying, it is so terrible in other ways. Just the, the recitation of the abuse that your, was visited upon your mother is very hard to read. It's obviously the, the remembering and the intuiting of the kind of physical harm that he's inflicting on your mother, but it's also terrifying and, and horrible to read the, the, the harm he inflicted on you in trying to silence you. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's this one passage where you come home and you say, I'm going to be a writer. Right. And he says to you, you're not going to do any of that. Right. I can't think of a more terrible thing to say to a child. Yes. I, I mean, I think that anything that seemed like um, a dream that I had, uh, he was going to try to find a way to shut that down. Um, and that uh, is a very telling moment in my relationship with my mother as well, because she was, you know, obviously enduring um, physical abuse at his hands, often out of sight, but something I could hear. And for years, um, in order to to kind of do a kind of dissembling and to keep him from uh, going into a violent rage later on, out of sight, um, she would only um, talk to me about my accomplishments or achievements when he wasn't around. It was something that we had to keep secret. But that particular day, I came home so excited, I couldn't wait. And I said that at the dinner table. And when he said, you're not gonna do any of that, I could see my mother's hand clench the fork she was holding and her jaw clench. And she said, she will do whatever she wants. And even in that moment, I knew the price that she was going to pay mm -hmm. for defending me. Mm -hmm. And as much as it, she was, you know, willing to do that and, and knowing the cost, she wasn't going to let him batter my soul in the same way mm -hmm. that he was battering hers. Mm -hmm. Your stepfather murdered your mother. He murdered her after she had left him, after a long history of abuse. That's right. Um, that, that's the foundational fact. Him. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. She'd been divorced for him, from him for nearly two years um, when he murdered her. So she indeed had done everything right and gotten away, and he continued to stalk her. He even went to prison for attempting 
well, he wasn't convicted of attempted murder, but he did try to kill her once before on Valentine's Day in 1984. He went to prison for about a year, but only convicted of criminal trespass. And when he got out, he came back and finished what he started. Natasha, it's another hard thing, but it's my understanding that he's actually been released from prison now. Is that true? That's right. He was released in March of last year. May I ask, do you feel safe from him? You know, the day that I found out, I had the strangest sensation of being inside my mother's body. And I was very afraid and I felt very unsafe. I think the only thing that makes me feel safe or a modicum of safety is that I don't live in Atlanta anymore. I got out of Atlanta just before he was released, a, a year or two before. And so that helps. The distance helps. Um, mm -hmm. But I think I've never truly felt safe in the world. Hmm. Cassie Lehman writes in the New York Times that Trethewey's memoir is not the hardest book I have ever read. He says the poetry holding the prose together, the innovativeness of the composition makes such a claim impossible. Memorial Drive is the hardest book I could imagine writing. And, and truly, you do some very difficult things in this book. I mean, you go through the files, like you're the police officer, incredibly, you encounter the police officer who uh, responded to your mother's murder and he retrieves the files for you. Right. And you go through them all. I just find myself wondering how you were able to do that, to read, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that she was keeping notes of what was happening to her, create, you know, to create some sort of protection from her, for herself, which ultimately did not succeed. But how, how did you, how did you do that? And why did you feel that was so necessary to do? Well, I resisted doing it for a long time. Um, you know, he gave me those files in 2005 and I did not allow myself to sit and go through them until I was in the process of writing this book. Um, I didn't want to have to, to look at those things. I'd been trying to, I think, forget and avoid as much as I could, you know, over these last, uh, you know, three decades. And finally, when I did sit down, um, it, it was as if um, I were reliving um, mm -hmm. those, those, those days. Um, they came all back to me and the grief, even now, Having done that, um, the grief feels much more immediate as opposed to sort of the, the dullness of it that I've lived with, um, you know, my whole adult life. Um, but I think it was important because it allowed the possibility of my mother's voice to enter this book along with mine. And I knew that that was important because I could tell you um, how resilient and powerful and loving she was, or I could just let you see it for yourself. And I think when you read those documents that I include in the book, you see it for yourself. The evidence is incontrovertible. I'm reminded that as we are speaking now, this country among, and, and along with many, many others, many people are still in lockdown mode. I mean, many people are trapped at home. I can't help but think about other people who might be trapped in similar circumstances and as part of this effort to control this health crisis, but part of it makes me worry that another crisis is afoot. And, and I wonder if you think about that too, given what you saw, given what you grew up with. I do, and it's, it's, a, it's a terrifying moment uh, to think about how many people might be in a situation of, of domestic violence. Um, one of the things that I think about all the time is that uh, in the language of organizations committed to ending domestic violence, my mother was referred to as a perfect victim. Mm -hmm. And that's because not only um, did she 
do everything right? Uh, did she seek out the right re uh, resources to get out of this marriage? But she was also um, an educated professional woman who was not dependent upon her abuser for uh, for shelter, for for the care of her children, for support, for financial support. And so if you have someone like my mother, like that, who can't even get away, what can you say to women who are in that situation but are dependent on their abusers for support? It's almost impossible to get away. And if you add to that, that the, the chances of you dying go up not when you stay, but when you leave, it makes it almost impossible. And we are in a moment where all of that is the case now, and it's even harder to leave because where will people go um, during this time of lockdown? This country is very, you know, fractured and traumatized right now, I feel comfortable in saying. Um, is there something we can learn from your story, do you think, as a country? Oh, well, I, I, I would hope a lot of things, actually. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I deal with constantly is the idea of uh, memory and forgetting. Um, on a personal level, you know, one might argue that for a long time, I enacted a kind of forgetting, thinking that that was helping me some kind of way. And yet, um, even as I was consciously trying to forget, I think our bodies recall trauma. So it was still there with me, waiting to so somehow attack me at a different point. I think that's a, a metaphor for um, our kind of cultural amnesia in this country, that wounds that we haven't healed, that we've simply allowed to fester, are waiting to make us sick, to make us even more damaged because we haven't contended with the truth of our shared history. I think that that's what this moment of reckoning is about. So I always, you know, Yates wrote, we make of the quarrel with others rhetoric, but of the quarrel with ourselves poetry. I always begin with the argument, the quarrel I have with myself in order to talk about the larger quarrel that I have with my nation over our historical amnesia about race, about the aftermath of the Civil War, about the causes of the Civil War, about the reason that we erected monuments to the Confederacy. All of those things, if we don't deal with the truth of them, they're going to continue to erode us as a nation. Natasha Trapper, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you, Michelle.